Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining the second Asia Pacific Regional Dialogue on Scaling Up Locally Led Adaptation. My name is Orko Senaroy and I work with the Asian Development Bank and very happy to moderate today's discussion. This dialogue is a part of a series of six dialogues being organized across Asia Pacific, Africa, and Latin America and the Caribbean region on the same theme around scaling up local led adaptation. The Asia Pacific Dialogue, in particular, is um, you know, supported by the International Center for Climate Change and Development, International Institute for Environment and Development, World Resources Institute, and Save the Children Australia. Some of you might have already attended the first dialogue, which was organized on 7th of September last month, where we really heard about some great examples from Asia Pacific region on delivery mechanisms in support of local led adaptation. We heard examples from national governments, of national governments, and civil society organizations on how some of the delivery mechanisms are very effectively helping us scale up adaptation solutions at the local level. Today, we really want to take the discussion forward, and we want to discuss about the pathways for achieving locally led adaptation. Specifically, we would like to identify what are some of the enablers or factors that can facilitate locally led adaptation at scale. We would like to understand what, what role the climate, international climate finance can play in support of such pathways. We would also like to hear from you what is your biggest ask from upcoming COP26 in Glasgow. And last but not the least, to also identify some key follow-up actions that can be taken forward post-COP in 2022 to really build the momentum and convert these dialogues into real actions. The agenda for today's dialogue is structured around four main key segments. We will start with an introduction and a keynote and we're delighted to have with us Sheila Patel, the director and founder of the Society for the Promotion of Area Resource Center with us. And this will be followed by a discussion a session on presentation where we will hear a quick recap about the past at uh, the first dialogue and a discussion on pathways for achieving local led adaptation. The main heart of today's discussion is the breakout group where we will divide ourselves into six to eight groups to discuss some of the key enablers, the changes required, and the asks for COP26. And lastly, we will try to synthesize the discussions coming from the group, group, group discussion and see, identify some of the concrete actions to take forward. Um, we encourage all of you to please introduce yourself in the chat box, write your name, organizations, and the topics you're working on, which will help us um, in, in this discussion. So without further ado, let me introduce, uh, let me invite Sheila Patel to kindly deliver her keynote address. Sheila, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Agar. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, good morning. I hope all of you have your cup of coffee with you or tea. Uh, I, I feel very honored as a grassroots activist to be here today to speak about the challenges of ensuring that uh, vulnerable communities, uh, people in difficult situations, uh, duty bearers like uh, government institutions and global agencies all work together uh, to take the challenge of local adaptation forward. The reality is that we don't have to wait for what climate change can do in our lives, it's there. It's too much or too little of something or the other. Uh, pandemics, this pandemic and all the challenges it has brought has really demonstrated how things we don't anticipate completely take over our lives. So today, my general feeling is that all of us as individuals doing whatever we are doing, and especially those who have a deep commitment to social justice, for ensuring that governance systems work, that we have accountabilities at all levels, we have to push forward to make sure that all the work that has gone in bringing 
adaptation, especially locally led adaptation to go shoulder to shoulder with the transformation we require in the climate change arena. So my, my points for discussion today are the following. First of all, I feel that we all have to examine the difference between the aspiration for modernity, which a lot of us in Asia have. We want to do things which are modern, which are transformative, but we all know that most of that is based on expanding GDP, on expanding, and it's all based on, on carbon growth. So if you want to move into something that is sustainable, that is socially just, that is equitable, there's a huge transition that needs to take place. And we all have to be part of that transition. And therefore in today's discussion, we have to look at what are our asks for ourselves and what are our asks for everybody at different levels. But we cannot just expect global discourse to be the only resolvers of local problems. We have to take charge of that. The second thing that I believe is critical is that adaptation is clearly a local business. It's a local ask and it's something that has to be done locally. And we have the right to demand changes at all levels. But it also requires all of us who are operating, organizing, uh, working locally to not feel shy about expressing what our own roles should be and what everybody else's role should be. And I think one of the biggest challenges in local adaptation space is our role and contribution in exploring partnerships with state, private sector, and even some citizen-led actions which have been exclusionary, which have not involved us in the dialogue, which have told us what to do. And it requires a change in the mindset, not only of others, but also ourselves. And therefore, we need to be able to take conversations that mean a lot to us to different levels is I think very important. All of us in Asia are constantly told that we face either too much of something or too little, too much heat, too little, too much water, no water. And I think that local adaptation is the real space in which the nuances of how this has to be addressed has to emerge and it has to be mainstreamed. In doing that, there are different roles that different people play. And I hope that in our discussion today, we are able to map those. Finally, I'm hearing too much or too little of either asks of global finance, too much, we need more global finance, but we say the global finance is not being used. It doesn't come to communities. It doesn't come to localities. But I think that in reality, the role of global finance is to trigger change and to make sure that that change is socially just. And I think that the commitment that many of us have made to the locally led adaptation principles and practice, not only in the case of financing, but also actions, just transform the relationship that all of us have with each other. And I would really like that concept and those principles to be very deeply entrenched in our activities, our actions, our asks, and our financing models. There are so many crossovers in the conversations like this that are happening with Africa and in Latin America. And I feel that by just having us work in Asia and not looking at what's happening in Africa or Latin America uh, reduces our ability to explore 
explore choices or actions, failures, successes that other areas have. And I hope that all of us will have the opportunity to explore that as well. Everybody talks about the youth dividend, but I think it's going to be a huge challenge to transform this dividend into actual reality in present circumstances, where the youth, especially youth that are uh, vulnerable, youth that are locked into intergenerational poverty, to make choices that are constructive and that work for them in the future. And in Asia, that's a big challenge. I know that in South Asia, it's a really huge challenge that we have to accept. Uh, finally, <clears throat> you know, whenever we talk about actions, we talk about engagement, we talk about discussions, the words that keep coming out are accountability, risk management, uh, an inability to communicate, and a deep despair about the huge, huge chasm between different constituencies. So those of us who are involved in facilitating these dialogues, we are deeply encouraged by the excitement and the commitment and the long-term engagement that more and more constituencies are making to making this decade a decade of action. And therefore, I hope that at the end of this discussion, we not only come out with our asks, but we also come out with a list of actions that we will collectively make as a community that cares about change that works for everybody. So thank you for being here today. And I look forward for this process to continue. Thank you. Back to you, Adgo. Thank you, Sheila, so much for your very powerful messages. And I take uh, some key highlights from here. The first is to the need to take charge, uh, demand for space for local adaptation actions, um, ensure that global finance is really used to trigger changes that are socially equitable. And last but not least, to collectively identify actions that different constituencies can take of themselves, but also together. And of course, in all of this, the key issue about partnership of social equity, about cross fertilization of ideas across regions is absolutely critical. And this is fantastic because it kind of set the scene for us for today's dialogue. And keep in mind that ultimately we're looking for really concrete actions moving forward. So thank you, Sheila, for so much for that. Um, uh, to move forward, I will now request His Excellency Robert Dixon, High Commissioner for Bangladesh, um, in High Commissioner for UK in Bangladesh, to kindly provide his welcome remarks. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for welcoming me. And it's a great pleasure and privilege to be um, helping to launch this uh, dialogue this morning. Um, Bangladesh is at probably in the almost more than any other country is in the forefront of climate change. Um, and I've been very conscious of that in the two and a half years that I've been here as uh, High Commissioner. And increasingly, as we see globally, uh, the effect that climate related disasters and unpredictable weather events are having a very profound uh, effect, both on everyday lives, uh, but also on ecosystems and economies. Uh, nowhere is that more the case than in Bangladesh, where every day, uh, we see both dramatic disasters, but we also see the steady erosion of riverbanks and we see communities often of marginalized people who are having to take very practical measures to, uh, to move themselves from uh, the forefront uh, as their communities literally uh, crumble around them. So this is a huge issue for Bangladesh. And as you might expect, it's a very major part of the partnership that we as the UK uh, have with Bangladesh. Um, but there's also a lot we can learn from this country because Bangladesh uh, has been in many ways, as, as in so many other ways, Bangladesh, as it celebrates its 50th anniversary, uh, has remarkable successes to record in climate adaptation. And I think just to take one really dramatic example, uh, one of the founding events in the history of Bangladesh was the terrible cyclone in 1970, which killed up to a million people, nobody really knows, but that caused terrible uh, human loss. And an equivalent uh, cyclone came through the region last year and killed 12 people. So that is a remarkable example of how the 
uh, very systematic approach that successive governments of Bangladesh have taken to handling the problem of extreme weather has achieved um, remarkable results. Uh, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from Bangladesh uh, when we look at this, including the success that Bangladesh has had in uh, reflecting uh, government policy at community level, because that really is the key in a densely packed delta, uh, most of it at sea level, uh, to achieving results. It's joining up national policy uh, with uh, local uh, leadership and with the engagement of local people. And that has been in this country uh, a remarkable success. And we as an international community, I think, must do more to try and help drive not just good policy, the sort of things that will be discussed in the conference centre in Glasgow at the beginning of next month, uh, but also effective adaptation on the ground. And as I said, I do think there's a tremendous amount that we can learn from the government to which uh, I am uh, currently uh, accredited. And it's obviously a critical part of what we as a presidency are seeking to catalyse as we go through COP26 uh, into the African presidency of COP27 uh, and beyond. And I think it's very important that we demonstrate, as I said, all the way through, we have a holistic approach which uh, drives government policy and principles uh, in a way that really makes a practical difference to marginalised uh, people uh, on the ground who are, in the end, the most effective uh, agents uh, of change. We've been very strong supporters of the LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, uh, the programme that we are uh, part of today. Uh, and we are absolutely going to be ensuring that this, uh, what this group has been doing is reflected uh, in the adaptation strand, uh, which will be such a prominent part uh, of what we do at uh, COP26. Uh, and it's great that we've been able, as, we, as you were just saying, uh, Sheila Patel, uh, bringing together approaches from across different regions, that mutual learning uh, is tremendously important as we shape the thinking uh, for a global effect, uh, for a global uh, event uh, like the one that we will be hosting next month in Glasgow. So thank you very much to everyone for convening today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roy, for your role in uh, convening. Uh, I think this is going to be a tremendously useful discussion. I'm very pleased to uh, play a small part in declaring it open. So I hope you have a very productive series of discussions. I unfortunately have to go and see the Environment Minister and the Energy Minister and some last minute COP negotiating business uh, right now. So I won't be able to join the discussions, but I'm delighted they're happening. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for your part in, in, uh, in making them happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dixon, for your kind words, but also actually um, helping us recognize that there's much to learn from the region and the countries in the region. Lots has happened, specifically looking at long-term commitments of some of the governments, looking at more holistic approach, where a whole of society approach been taken by governments in partnership with local communities to build resilience. And last but not the least, to see how these commitments are converted into effective actions on the ground. And we very much like to thank you and Government of UK for really leading this work on local adaptation and, of course, your support for Life AR initiative, which is a quite a pioneering initiative in the region itself. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you. So uh, this was a very excellent opening session. Uh, before we dive into the um, session, looking at two presentations, it might be a good uh, time for us to uh, in engage in a warming exercise. So we would do a, a, what we call a chat shower, where we will ask two questions. We'll request all of you to type very brief responses in the chat bar, but don't hit the send button yet. We will hit it together so that we get a shower of insights from all of you on these questions. So uh, let's start with the first question, which is shown on the slide now. What is the change you would like to see to scale up locally led adaptation? If you can briefly type your responses, but don't send it yet, we will send it all together. So what is the change we would like to see to scale up locally led adaptation? Okay, please send your reply now, hit the send button, great. Oh, it's difficult for me to follow something. Uh, some interesting points coming out. Um, changes in policymakers' mindsets, resources by government and financial institutions to community and grassroots groups, recognizing their innovations, national governments committing to locally led adaptation in their climate strategies, access to global climate finance, more decentralized finance that incentivizes local interventions, fantastic. 
government institutions partnership with local communities, which was also highlighted by Sheila in her opening remarks, recognizing an adequate financing, changing mindsets, space for the poor people, very important. Community engaged science led initiatives. Wow, that's a quite a bit of list that we have got over here. Increased access to finance for local communities. So there are lots to work on the change side. That's very good. So thank you, everybody. Maybe we will move on to the next question now, which is what is your biggest hope for locally led adaptation at the upcoming COP26? Please type a brief response, but don't send it yet. Okay, let's go ahead with the second response. You can hit the send button now. Leaders listening to and responding. COP26 finds a solution to address loss and damage. Get commitment for long-term funding. That's extremely important. A clear message emerges about its effectiveness. We make the year 2022 as a year to start actions on the ground to report, fantastic. Prioritize and find solutions. Ensure food security for the affected people, very critical, long-term funding again. So more emphasis for or focus given to adaptation, can't agree more on that. Commit finance to support actions by local communities, women, youth. So clearly there are some common messages coming from two questions. One was about in terms of um, the, you know, what changes are needed. We need more actions from national governments. We need the space for the poor people to participate in these processes. We need global climate finance. Uh, we need collaborations and partnerships. And in terms of the biggest hope from COP26, commitment for long-term funding is absolutely critical, funding that is going to the local level. Um, more emphasis for adaptation is, is, is required. Increased climate finance contributions from GCF and other climate funds um, and the importance of coalition. That's great, fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. That was very, very useful. So that's bringing us to the end of our first segment, the opening segments. Now we will go into two presentations. So the first one, I'll invite Suranjana Gupta, advisor on community resilience from the Wairu Commission to introduce the eight principles of local adaptation and also give us a quick recap of what happened in the first dialogue in September. Suranjana, the floor is yours. Thanks, Onko. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second dialogue. It's my job today to remind you and set a bit of context for the second round of dialogues. I'll start off simply by saying that the first set of dialogues that was held in the three regions focused on the locally led adaptation principles, primarily <clears throat> sorry, as a set of normative principles. These, this was a framework of concepts to guide our actions. This time we're looking more at the principles from a cons uh, for, from a, uh, an operational side. What does it take to put the principles into action? And do we actually recognize locally driven adaptation when we see it on the ground? So, Let's start with the first slide there. You can see that the goal of this uh, project led by IIED and WRI is really to look at how do we scale up both state and non-state led, locally led adaptation, and how do we develop and understand the pathways through which mechanisms for locally led adaptation can evolve. To go to the next slide, you can see there that 100 examples, over 100 examples of locally led adaptation delivery mechanisms, ways in which our, our financing for locally driven action are reaching the ground have been crowdsourced by IIED. And there you can see that some of them, these were featured, the, the ones in green were featured in the first round of dialogues. This, uh, 
There's some case studies under development already, and then there's a third set which are being um, sort of investigated and looked at currently. And we hope that you'll share more examples of, that you know of in the discussion coming up. Let's go to the next slide. We're at, so on the eight principles, um, the dialogues all featured last time case examples in which the principles were being localized and we saw how they look when they're being implemented. So the first principle, which is about devolved decision-making to the lowest appropriate level is really important, both from the perspective of social justice and including those who have been historically left out of decision-making and of driving public agendas, as well as because the impacts of climate change need to be understood from a very context specific place. This principle becomes really one of the key driving principles of locally led adaptation and the county, uh, the decentralized county funds from Kenya were a very good example of how 70% of funds go to the low, lowest level of, uh, of implementation and higher levels of government do not have veto rights. Then we have the second uh, principle which focuses on structural addressing structural inequalities. And there we heard from the Gungano Urban Poor Fund and Yakum Emergency Unit in Indonesia. Both these were about essentially putting resources in the hands of marginalized groups as part of building their capacities and enabling their voices to shape public decision-making processes and allowing them to drive resources towards what they consider their big priorities. So those are the first two. The third one about providing patient and predictable funding that can be accessed more easily. There you see that the SGF and the Pawanka Fund both use uh, uh, strategies to make the funds more accessible to local uh, groups and local constituencies. But I would add there that when these kinds of funds invest in processes that have a long uh, time frame and require uh, a process of incubation where the results are not immediately visible and cannot be counted easily, those also represent ways of providing patient and predictable funding. Then we have the, uh, sorry, there was one more, sorry. Yeah, uh, the investment in local capabilities and leaving behind an institutional legacy. And there were examples of that from the Micronesia fund and uh, another Latin American fund as well as Canary. And this is a vital uh, 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 principle or feature of locally driven action because we want to make sure that investments actually leave something behind in terms of local capacities and some sort of enduring legacy which will serve local communities and local people in the long term. And they're more than just projects. Let's go to the next slide, please. Then we had uh, the idea of building a robust understanding of uh, climate risk and helping people understand the uncertainty. And the examples were from Funde Cooperation and uh, the County Fund in Kenya, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in India. All of them had ways of bringing climate information to local groups and enabling them to understand more about the unpredictable weather patterns and changes in climate that are impacting their lives and livelihoods. The flexible programming and learning are also very critical because it requires the unpredictability of climate change requires groups to quickly two needs that are coming up locally. The Pawanka Fund provided this, and we saw this in a lot of funds, and they reacted to the COVID crisis by quickly 
uh, providing resources that could be used for the co uh, groups to deal with the COVID crisis. The principle on ensuring transparency and accountability, this is about strength, both strengthening systems locally so that people can actually very simply have the systems in place that will show and demonstrate their ability to be accountable and transparent, but it's equally about being transparent and accountable to local groups where we need to deliver impact and uh, redressing the balance between accountability to funders and financiers and accountability to local groups who tend to be marginalized and whose voices tend to go unheard. And the final uh, principle focuses on collaborative action. Sheila was just talking about bridging different actors and helping them talk to one another and collaborate with one another. And the best, I think, examples of, of this uh, is something that we need to understand more about replicating. And we know also that you need longer time frames in order to do this work. So let's go to the next slide. Um, some of the headlines that, that came up in the last discussion in terms of what uh, people want to look at in terms of asks moving forward. Uh, the first one was about a $1 billion locally led adaptation fund, a call from Diane Black Lane from AOSIS as part of a larger fund uh, to, uh, reduce, to increase fossil fuel subsidies. The second headline is around uh, promoting more devolved decision making and voices of local government and local voices from the ground uh, in order to ensure that we are more responsive to local contexts. The third focuses on longer time horizons that are needed, not the two and three year projects that we often get and uh, local people's time needs to be acknowledged. The fact that when they participate in processes that shape policies and programs, their time needs to be um, remunerated and they need to be recognized for doing this work. And that community and local <clears throat> sorry, organizations shouldn't be bearing all the financial risks. Right now, the way in which risk is being def defined is that a lot of uh, global institutions, financing institutions, donors, pass on a large part of the risk to local groups and local communities, and they can ill afford to bear these risks. And we need to look at new ways of looking at risk so that this burden is not on the local groups who are most affected by the making processes. Uh, here the local, traditional, and indigenous gr uh, groups have broad networks and trusted networks, which are vital to delivering local action and scaling up local action. So some of the questions that came up in the last session focused on intermediaries really needed to support locally led adaptation and what would be their role in delivering locally led adaptation. How are excluded people actually involved? People wanted to know concretely, what are the ways and mechanisms in which local groups, local communities and how can actually be involved in shaping decision-making processes around locally led adaptation. And groups with dis living with disabilities were one specific group uh, that was pointed out, pointed to. Um, how are local groups and organizations supported to build resilience in the long term? So that was another, um, another piece that people wanted to understand better and you know, what kinds of tools, that, what kinds of scenarios we need to plan for, how do we need to create the ability to anticipate crisis? And what's the role of the private sector, uh, financial institutions, microfinance institutions, cooperatives, and so on in delivering locally led adaptation? So those are the eight principles. And with that, let me pass it back to Orgo, unless, 
anyone has any questions. And please put your questions into the chat if there are any, and I can answer them, or we can find somebody else among the organizers to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Anjana, so much for reminding us about the eight principles, but more importantly, giving sharing with us these excellent examples on how these different um, you know, delivery mechanisms, different initiatives are already contributing to these eight principles and what we can learn from them and how it can be used to scale up. Also um, um, mentioning and highlighting the uh, key recommendations that had come out from these dialogues, including the need for a big financial target for local adaptation, the importance of long-term financing, and a key point about um, responsibilities for sharing risk at all levels. And last but not the least, highlighting some of the important questions that emerged in the first dialogue, including about the need or suitability of the perfect type of intermediary that's required uh, or not required at all, uh, how to engage meaningfully the, the vulnerable population in these actions, uh, involvement of the private sector, um, and other modalities for financing local adaptation. So thank that's very useful. Um, so please do pose your question in the chat box. And now we'll move to the next presentation and I'll request my colleague Istiag Ahmad, who is a senior program coordinator for International Center for Climate Change and, Ad and Development to make a presentation on the pathways to scale up local adaptation. Istiag, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ego. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Pardon me, my, I'm struggling with poor internet for, for a few days, so I'll keep my video off. Uh, so my part uh, is to give you an explanation before going to the breakout discussion from the last dialogue and uh, what are the pathways that we are thinking of so that you have a better idea before going to the uh, breakout session and share your thoughts. Some of the points already Shurunjana has touched on, but I will go through all the points in a bit detail. So the first, for, to start with, I uh, will reflect on the discussion and some of the findings from the case studies uh, for delivering uh, local aid adaptation that we uncovered during the first dialogue. Secondly, what are the ways the international climate finance needs to shift and change to better support the development of these types of approaches to allow them to achieve the impact on scale? And finally, uh, we will discuss if you were to pick one, what would be your ask, key ask for COP26? So just to recap, particularly uh, for those who were not at the first dialogue, one of the key questions that ruled during the first dialogue was, why do we need intermediation? Does that support local elite adaptation? It was discussed that obviously we may need intermediaries because the sources of finance that kind of achieving impacts such as international climate finance, for national funding, development funding, even private sector finance are often too large to reach the local level efficiently. So we do often need intermediaries. But crucial thing is about shifting to a better type of intermediation, working with actors that are more account accountable, closer, connected to the local realities and local actors, whether that being able to channel international funds to the local level. And these exist across the whole of society, including state and government civil society and the private sector that are better placed, whether that be local government, local enterprises, local banks, grassroots, grassroots organizations, community-based organization and cooperatives to better facilitate and channel money to the local level. Now, crucially, this need to be able to support the inclusive governance. These are key enablers, being able to represent local stakeholders, giving excluded people a voice, being able to take climate information, which is often complex, so help the local constituents understand it. Find a space for rapid learning and adjustment to feed in new knowledge, whether that beyond climate resilience or climate risks into the future, and help improve how adaptation solutions are delivered, especially better with an institution that are sustainable, politically stable, and within the country. So now the first dialogue we heard uh, from 11 fantastic case studies approaches on delivery mechanisms supporting local adaptation across Africa, Asia, and Latin America, displaying various good practices in delivering the eight principles for local elite adaptation. Uh, so my colleague Shurandana already has mentioned that we already have uh, developed few case studies. Some are still in development uh, process, development state, and we're still looking for others. 
these are few, uh, just few examples, uh, and we were kind of shown in the map, and we are looking uh, for new case studies. We are trying to identify new case studies, and we are almost sure that they are happening around the world. So if I go, uh, if I kind of share the context of each of the case studies to start with, with, for the first one we have is community on granting, the community adaptation small grants facility, South Africa, separated by Sanbi and South South North, separate and separated by adaptation fund. This uh, fund is supporting local elite adaptation in livelihoods, agriculture, and human settlements. Uh, the second one we have is county climate change funds using devolution in Kenya, supporting local elite adaptation, public goods via local government institutions on poor rural areas dominated by pastoralism and agriculture. The next one we have is urban poor funds revolving local savings in Zimbabwe. This is supporting urban poor priorities for capital grants and facilitation own savings via revolving funds for sustainable slum upgrading. Increasingly moving into adaptation, delivering amazing results for the poor with modest resources. The uh, next one we have is whole of society local on granting and on lending environment investment fund in Namibia, providing grants and loans to NGOs, SMEs and local government via endowment funds, international climate finance and international levies for natural resource management and climate change adaptation and mitigation. The next one we have is from Bangladesh. It's Climate Bridge Fund by BRAC. Uh, it's facilitating direct grants to Bangladeshi NGOs, supporting urban adaptation, uh, adaptation measures, particularly in the context of climate-induced migration, covering five city corporations, and it's supported by KFW. The next one we have is local on granting in the Pacific Micronesia Con uh, Conservation Trust a non-profit corporation providing long-term sustained and small grants for partner-led conservation activities in the context of local climate change across the federated states of Micronesia. We have another one uh, titled Community Resilience Funds and Making Decentralization Work by Grassroot Yekum Emergency Unit in Indonesia. It's a grassroot-led NGO supporting a community resilience fund providing small grants to women-led groups. The other one we have is Adaptive Special Protection Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in Orisha, India, utilizing the country's social protection mechanism and decentralization structure to provide climate resilience benefits across many rural households. The next one we have is Global Fund for uh, Indigenous Peoples, uh, which is Puanka Fund. Global Indigenous Peoples led fund to finance Indigenous Peoples in, in initiatives via grant making directly to Indigenous Peoples organization. The next one we have a civil society on granting via Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund, CEPF in Caribbean, utilizing Canary, a regional intermediary with local footprint, 10 year grant making to CSOs for protection of critical ecosystem and to build re climate resilience in the Caribbean, including CSOs led by women, youth and indigenous people. The last one uh, we have uh, microfinance for resilience, Funde Cooperation, a private foundation with strong public and private sector collaborations seeking to support financial inclusion and sustainability in the tourism and agriculture. And we also request, please continue to share stories of delivery mechanisms. Uh, template is available and you will, if you wish to share your delivery mechanism, we will uh, share those ones with all of you. So taking all of these approaches, these delivery mechanisms, we have identified a set of themes. We have state and government-led approaches, civil society and partnership-based approaches, and private sector approaches. Now they overlap in terms of their collaborations, but we have various different themes emerging from. Utilizing state-led approaches and national climate funds to provide grants and loans across local organizations, local government approaches where countries are using progressive decentralization frameworks, utilizing its existing architecture to get climate finance to the local level, to the, to the hands of local governments down to the communities. Utilizing social protection scheme where cash transfer or the process says exist to delivery assets that are essential for the most vulnerable. Then the civil society led approaches such as uh, those that aggregate communities and poor people's own savings such as an urban poor fund, such as the Ghana Community Resilience Fund, such as the ACA Emergency Unit. So civil society is a leading grant making to other civil society organization essential for meeting local needs. And the last one is we 
have private sector led approaches, which we need to unpack more, such as microfinance institutions, cooperatives, even local commercial banks. Sorry. The sec, uh, so, the, so going into the first question for the breakout session, we'd really like to think about these different types of delivery mechanism approaches, these different themes, these different types of uh, the state government led or civil society led or private sector led uh, approaches, different contexts, and to think what are the enablers that we can help the scale up of these different types of local delivery mechanisms or approaches. So what might enable government-led finance to increase in locally led adaptation? What might enable civil society to increase in finance or support locally led adaptation? The enablers for increasing private sector-led approaches to support locally led adaptation. This could be having a strong local presence, having strong local networks, having supporting policy and regulations like decentralization, having strong support for building local capabilities. But what kind of capabilities having bespoke finance mechanisms and what might be the key features and do they have committed domestic source resources and from where? That brings me to the second question. The second question uh, we want to ask is how can international climate finance better support these local adaptations? Who are these finances that can really support uh, this long-term patient predictable finance? It's easiest to be accessed, accessed and it's more mentoring and supporting. It's more flexible. It's this philanthropy fund, uh, which bilateral donors might be engaged. What is the role of multilateral development banks? So these are some questions that we want to explore more. What is the role of global climate funds? Do they currently play the right role? We know that it's incredibly poor, ex poorly accessed at present and with only three EDA projects from GCF. Is there a need for a new funding window? And finally, the question we asked was, uh, Argo mentioned several times that what is our key ask at COP26 to better support locally led adaptation? So now in the first round of dialogues in the Latin America, the Carib and Caribbean dialogues, uh, where we got a call for $1 billion fund for locally led adaptation from Dan Black. But is this enough? Uh, in the African dialogue yesterday, we had a call for 5 billion per year to flow directly to regional, national, and subnational institution not through international entities like the MDBs or UN agencies. And we want to ask you today, is this enough? What would it look like? What would be your key ask at COP that we can fit into COP presidency? So we are hopeful that you will share your thoughts in the breakout, room, breakout sessions right after this presentation. And we will have our thoughts uh, provided to the COP presidencies. Thank you. Thank you, Arvo. Back to you. Thank you, Ishak, so much. That was a very, very useful presentation. Um, thanks for um, sharing the various examples. And I think this 100 examples is a very powerful tool in itself to go and use it during uh, when we talk to governments, national governments and international donors and climate funds uh, of how these practices are actually working on ground and have enough evidence uh, and needs to be scaled up. So that's, that's very good. Also for introducing the interesting Venn diagram, which shows clearly the different kind of delivery mechanisms, and all of them are important and uh, perhaps can be enhanced, improved, or strengthened the, co the coherence between them. But nevertheless, these are existing you know, institutions in place in many countries and needs further support and to be strengthened and to be scaled up. So that, that's great. So with this, uh, if anybody has any specific question, please do uh, type in the chat box. And we will move on to the third segment of, which is the breakout groups. We will divide ourselves into around six groups or so. Each group will have a moderator and the moderator uh, could use a Jamboard as required. As Ishtiak presented in each group, we would like you to answer three basic questions. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, first is, what are some of the enablers to scale up locally led adaptation? So Ranjana talks about the eight principles. So if you really want to scale up actions around those eight principles, then what are the enablers? Second is what role can international climate finance better play to support these, these um, initiatives on the ground? We did hear from Sheila at the beginning that perhaps the climate finance or international finance needs to play a more catalytic role so that it can help unlock 
the potential for further actions on the ground for domestic sources of financing and others. And third, but not the least, is what would be your key ask for COP26 to support locally led adaptation? We did hear about the discussions in the Africa Dialogue about clear asks about financial uh, targets of a 1 billion or 5 billion per year um, for local led adaptations. So we would like to hear from you. But at the same time, there could be asks which are beyond financial targets about really looking at how aid principles can be systematically scaled up in countries of our region to support the needs of the communities themselves. Um, I understand that we will divide into four groups and not six groups. So uh, we will um, assign the groups uh, uh, by, uh, by ourselves on a random basis. We have about 35 minutes for group discussion. Please do actively participate in the group discussion because the last segment on synthesis will be key for us to hear from all of you on how do we take this forward. So with this, um, I'll request Jen to kindly assign ourselves to different groups. Okay, thank you everybody. I hope you had exciting discussion in your own groups. Uh, we had four groups, so maybe I'm gonna request, first of all, the uh, moderators or the reporters from each of the group to introduce themselves. Group one, may I know who will report back? So it's uh, group two, if it's me, I think it's Christopher with supported by myself, Marek. Thank you, Christopher, so much. Group three, Um, sorry, I don't know if we were group two or three, but um, I can report back for our group and we now we will jump in. Yep. Great, thanks. And the group four? Well, yeah, I took the notes, so I think I'm the one who's been delegated to speak. Okay, thank you. I'll request if we can have the spotlight in the four reporters on Aisha, is this correct that there are only four groups, correct? Yes. Super, all right. Um, Okay, thank, thanks, Aisha. At least you're maintaining the gender balance in the reporting group. That's just <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> we are all. Yes, yes, of course. So I, I would actually say we have some time and we have less number of groups, so we can really make it informal. So if you don't mind, I'm going to start with a few questions. Um, and uh, I would request each one of you to um, not to report back, but just uh, rather add on to if other people already said some things. I, I thought the group and I attended, there was a big discussion about changes in national government systems, which could facilitate locally led adaptation. I'm not using the word national governments, but rather government systems. So I'd be keen to hear from maybe group one other day, if you want to start, um, what kind of suggestions came and what changes are required in national government systems to support it. Sure, I think you're right, Orgo. There was quite a lot of discussion on this, and we had some interesting insights. For instance, uh, one of the I think good examples is that the government of Nepal has mandated that 80% of climate finance uh, needs to be invested at the local level, and a national policy directive of that nature can provide a major impetus for uh, locally led uh, adaptation and is can be a real pillar of an enabling environment for this. I think linked to this, uh, there was a really interesting uh, discussion also in our group on the degree to which the decentralized nature of governance in the country can support uh, LLA. And I think there was little doubt that uh, having uh, a decentralized federal structure is also one of the important preconditions to making LLA a uh, reality. You know, ensuring that LLA flourishes in a highly centralized uh, uh, administrative and political context is going to be quite difficult. Thank you, Aditya. Um, Aisha, anything from your side, from your group? Yeah, there was a point raised about, you know, sort of acknowledging that adaptation is this very continuous and long-term process. And so really needing a policy framework that supports this and, and having um, like a line item or a budget allocation uh, that supports locally led adaptation in, you know, linked to the annual development planning process. Um, and I thought this was a really good way of um, addressing the mainstreaming issue that was raised earlier and also the acknowledging the fact that this, you know, we can't just have this projectized funding that comes um, from the international sources, but really integrating it into these national systems, like you said. Okay. 
sorry, thank you. Paul from your group, any, any suggestions on this? Yeah, so the Nepal example came up in our group too and the importance of decentralization, but on the, on the not quite the flip side of that, but one of the other things that came out that was really interesting was a conversation around not just creating, enabling environments or, or kind of, you know, supporting those policies, but also actively removing policies that stand in the way of locally led adaptation. Um, so things that prevent local communities from being involved in decision making around climate finance was a key one. Uh, and then uh, kind of building from that, we had a conversation around the need to improve transparency at all levels around how finance is allocated and accessed um, and hand in hand with that reducing uh, corruption on the one hand. Um, and in fact, there was a comment made in our group that we might not necessarily need an increase in the amount of climate finance available if we could reduce um, uh, impediments to its delivery, uh, I including um, siphoning of, of funding along the, the chain. Um, and then the last point was around, um, again, related to that reducing transaction costs for communities, um, lowering the barriers to their involvement in these processes. Thank you, Paul. Marek? Or go, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, go ahead, uh, please. I, I was wondering if I can be slightly mischievous and ask a provocative question <laughs> on, on whether this contention that the more uh, decentralized the country is, the better the environment is for locally led adaptation is actually true or not. Uh, I mean, I think of centralized regimes like Vietnam, where there have been fairly robust uh, and rigorous approaches where local communities have had a say in determining adaptation actions. So I think, I mean, while I agree, and I'm for, not for one second am I saying that we should not have decentralization, but I'm saying, do we need to think about that a bit more carefully? Um, are there, I mean, and I'm saying this because in centralized countries, should we just throw up our hands and say, oh, we can't do anything about local LLA? I think there are still, there are examples that demonstrate that it's still possible to uh, operationalize locally led adaptation, even when uh, the political environment may be quite centralized and uh, a, a well functioning federal structure may not be there. That's my provocative input um, entirely well, from my side, well, not from my group. I'm going to respond with another provocative one, which is, you know, if, when, when the India process of decentralization began, there was an economist who said, you need a very strong center to support decentralization of decision-making and resources. So the issue is not centralized, decentralized. It's the, it's the actualization of the political will to allow resources to move to where they are needed. And, uh, and I think that's the, that's the caveat I want to put to what you were saying, Aditya, that it's not, uh, it, it, it's not to do with uh, uh, just decentralized. You need a very strong center to be committed to decentralization, whatever the regime is, whatever the political processes are. Uh, the, the issue is, do you want to give money in the hands of people who know? And you do you believe that poor and vulnerable groups know what they need? I mean, let's flip it like that. That's what I would say. Thanks, no, There is one point to add here. I'm sorry uh, to chip in. Uh, the, the, the father of uh, decentralized uh, uh, acts in India, uh, L.C. Jain, a Gandhian. Uh, I remember he quoted a simple example, how in a village panchayat, the lowest rung in the governance in India, uh, some president has taken some money for some service, you know, vendors. And others ask him, pay back that money. See, that's what uh, Sheila Madam is referring to here. You may have a strong center, no doubt, but uh, local, it could be enforcing, fine. But do we have some indicators to check whether the people involved are really empowered to take a decision and take a call. So if that doesn't happen, I think it will be back to square one. I think this is important. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, maybe I'll go back to Marek. Marek, from your group, any, any, any specific suggestions on national systems? Um, yes, I will promote others to come in it from my group because I'm there's a huge amount of content, but uh, maybe just to add to that fantastic discussion, is maybe just a few points uh, were um, opportunities to do things such as citizen-led science that really puts, I guess, uh, processes that allow citizens to be at the heart of showing what is the good evidence and what is 
classed as scientific information to be starting with. And the importance of translating both national and local policy into something that makes sense for local actors, particularly those excluded, not having them just in English, even when there are national policies and translating them into local language to actually allow that information to be available and observable to allow people to participate. Um, and obviously, as part of that, maybe just to build on that decentralization discussion, the importance of adequately building local government capacity in all of these issues around, I guess, you could frame it in a bundle around LLA in general and the principles and allow them to actually effectively um, play this, I guess, role of as a facilitating agent at the local level. Um, there are so many other ideas, but I'm sure we can add them more as the discussion continues. Oh, thanks, Marek. So, I mean, if I can go back to what Sheila was talking initially in the, in the keynote speech, if you had to identify some key actions, so to me, there are two, two buckets of action. One is within the climate community at the national level to really advocate and strengthen, ensure that the climate policies and plans are formally recognizing local adaptation solutions, and as in Nepal's case, having a specific fiscal target associated with it. On the other side is to work with the development community who are largely involved in decentralization processes and try to see how existing decentralization processes, are they really fit to deliver locally led adaptation in a context where climate is you know, changing so rapidly and we need much more flexible systems which allows learning to be captured and built upon. So going back to Aditya's question about Vietnam, I think a centralized system works, but if the centralized system works in terms of building local embankments, I don't, I'm not sure if it works in building other local solutions which are not so rigid always. It might need a different approach. So um, I think the two, the two key, key actions for us is to you know, scale it up through climate policies and plans, but equally have discussions around the decentralization community and see how we can in, in, inform or influence them. Uh, uh, my next question would be around this climate, international climate finance. And I'll be keen to hear from all of you uh, what your group discussed about what changes are needed in international climate finance. And once again, if I can go back to what Sheila was saying in a keynote speech, if international climate finance is to play a really a role of a trigger or a catalyst, then what changes do we need? So maybe we can start with Aisha. Thanks, Rago. Um, so we had some pretty good discussion about this in our group, and we, we of course talked about access, so needing to be, uh, needing simplified access. Um, but we also had a really interesting conversation about um, the, the proposals itself and the design of the proposal, and how if there was a requirement uh, that in the design there was involvement from the local level um, input as to what their priorities are and not just kind of input to priorities, but some, some aspects about capacity for following through once the project was over. So this, this feeds into the, the points about institution building and this being a long-term process and not just a project. Um, so that, that question of designing the proposal, but then the, the point was also raised that there is often a gap between who designs the proposal and who implements. And so having involvement at the design stage would really help bridge that gap and ensure that the local actors are involved in the design and the implementation. And this you know, allows for capacity building throughout the entire process, which in turn potentially could even um, help address this issue of direct access. Because I think it's a lot to ask for, you know, even where it's simplified access. Um, how simple is it really going to be? So there is this huge need to, to have a slow and steady process for building capacity for, for um, being engaged in, in this process of access and finance. Thanks, Aisha. Uh, Paul, do you want to share anything from your group? Yeah, we, we talked a bit about um, process and access as well. And one of the, the ideas that came up was um, whether they're permanent or, or transitional would be the establishment of sub funds or windows that specifically aim to, to support scaled up locally led adaptation, um, acknowledging that things like the green climate funds enhanced direct access um, 
while a good idea is struggling to deliver at this point. And so, um, you know, are there, are there ways in which these large scale funds can, can um, improve accessibility? Um, we didn't talk specifically about it, but I'm thinking now things like the, the Global Environment Facilities Small Grants Program is an interesting example of that kind of very, very local scale, but um, do we need something that sits between that and the very large scale finance that's, that's um, you know, impossible to access for, for communities and, and aggregator per se. We also talked a little bit about um, uh, a couple of things, one being a need to really rebalance towards adaptation. So um, acknowledging that historical um, uh, uh, lean towards mitigation of climate finance and the need to now that we know um, significant impacts are unavoidable regardless of, of the scale and rate of action to start to really scale up adaptation finance and not necessarily at the cost of mitigation finance but but certainly a scale up um, in terms of which a little bit at odds to, to what I said earlier about uh, reducing corruption perhaps meaning we need less funding overall but um, you know we, we can be a basket of contradictions um, and some discussion around uh, potential ways of calculating that looking at things like burden share and fair, and fair share um, on the one hand for levels of funding, but on the other hand for levels of access. So are there ways that we can look at um, specific vulnerability or risk metrics that could then target or help to target flows to particular places or particular communities? Um, the other thing that came up was a kind of a, a, a sideline on, you know, donors also need to let go a little bit, you know, let go of such tight control um, and, and speaking of decentralization, decentralize their, their management structure of funds a little bit to the lowest possible mechanism. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Marek? Thanks. Thanks, Agu. Um, yeah, so just to add to that, uh, not to, because um, many of those points were also covered in Agu about simpler access, um, maybe just to the two main points. Um, there's one really clear one was is it time that uh, the accounting principles that are utilized by international climate finance are reformed? Are they fit for purpose for supporting local led adaptation? There's a general consensus in our group that they're not. And they um, generally lead to too high risk aversion and an emphasis on fiduciary management rather than actually the risk of not investing. And um, is this really getting in the way of supporting effective financing to the local level? Um, and um, there's a general point on, I think it was in relation to a great discussion that we had on the role of the, potentially the role of local banks in facilitating local led adaptation and the need to, I guess, support them in, in financing that allows them to lend in more concessional ways. So uh, working very closely with local private sector that allows them to shift, I guess, the role that they have away slightly from purely profit driven to allowing themselves to work as a, in many cases, capable institutions that can facilitate finance to play a role in supporting more concessional lending and achieving impact. Um, and yet all the other points on more integrated approaches, not working climate mitigation, adaptation in silos, more patient funding, easier access work also coming. Thanks, Marek. Alok, yeah. So, so I think again, in the interest of not repeating um, the points that have already been mentioned, many of which, uh, which we discussed in our group as well, one additional thing that I would like to raise is there was an interesting you know, dichotomy uh, that was elicited in the discussions in our group. On one hand, this whole idea of simplified access um, meant that uh, you know one person in our group says that one of the ways of making sure that local organizations can access finance is to uh, parcel out small grants because they may not have the capacity to access and program large amounts of funding. On the other hand, there was an acknowledgement that we need long-term, larger programmatic approaches uh, for adaptation because this whole idea of let a thousand flowers bloom hasn't really worked. So how do we bridge this dichotomy of making sure that there are small grants for local organizations, but there is a large pot of funding multi-year in a programmatic approach? And I think we had a little back and forth on that. But essentially, and I'm looking to Bimalji here to correct me if I extracted the insight from that was, that we have a larger programmatic st strategic approach, uh, but that it is uh, it provides windows of funding that can be smaller for local organizations. So, so they can access these smaller parts of funding, but they're actually part of a broader long-term programmatic approach. 
I think that's one. And the second minor point that came up as part of this whole idea of simplified access was on monitoring and evaluation approaches that currently people felt were too onerous. And one of the tangible ways in which it is onerous is that there is an inordinate emphasis on tracking outputs, whereas shifting to a more outcome-oriented um, tracking process might provide a little more flexibility and room for local organizations to comply with the standards that have been dished out, especially as at the local level, operational environments are highly dynamic. Thanks, Aditya. So if I just kind of want to summarize the three, what I hear is one is the issue around uh, revisiting the metrics on, on basis on which you allocate adaptation finance accounting principles, uh, which um, you know, uh, looks at more a risk taking approach um, so these, these larger systems within the institutions have to change. Second is we did hear about um, in, you know, project financing is important, but at the same time, maybe financing processes are also equally important. And there has to be certain windows to finance processes, which will you know, capacitate the local governments and local communities so then to go ahead and implement actual projects. That's critical. And last but not the least about, we heard about this tension between longer term funding requirements and unpacking it or in smaller bites where actually specific windows are created at which can, which can be implemented based on local capacity. So that, that's a lot over here to digest. Uh, let me move on to the last and final question. And in interest of time, if you can just speak specifically, um, stick to one suggestion on what do we would like to hear from uh, uh, COP I don't think we have reached the chat shower yet. So maybe we can hold on for a minute over here. Uh, I just want to get back to the um, to the reporters. Thank you. So um, one, one suggestion from each of your group on COP26, what, what can be done? What realistically can be asked for? Uh, I'll go apologies. Uh, Suranjana's had a hand up for a bit. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Suranjana, do you want to come in? So, I'm so sorry, but I'm adding at the last moment, but uh, since I represent the private sector bank in Bangladesh, so I would like to add a, a bit of my insight of uh, the concept of risk sharing, because uh, we at, of course, private commercial banks are also always, uh, we think of the customers giving them proper return and things like this. So we, at many a times, there are uh, there are uh, challenges from our side too, and we also uh, want to do uh, uh, want to help the communities around us and uh, uh, facilitate as much as we can. But then again, uh, thinking in that perspective, I would like to also put on the table the concept of risk sharing because. Um, uh, since uh, there are issues of capacities in both for the uh, both at the private sector banks and as well as at the uh, the community we live in, there are uh, there are times that these communities do not know where to go to and seek help and come to the bank and when, whenever they need financing. So. At, uh, the, when the scenario is something like this, we need a kind of an intermediary who are well conversant with the with the rules and regulation of the private commercial bank, as well as they understand the need of the community, and also a mechanism more like something like a guarantee scheme, if possible. I don't know how it is going to fit in the scenario because our central bank is also thinking of some kind of uh, guarantee scheme to facilitate the sustainable financing. So uh, drawing analogy from that concept, so is it possible to also kind of offer some kind of guarantee scheme given by the international MFIs or I don't know, DFIs if possible and fast tag this LLA uh, financing as much as possible. So this was one thing. Another thing is uh, the importance of concessional lending. I would like to re-emphasize again because uh, since uh, we deal with people's money and we need to give them proper return. So if we get a concession, then we can in turn help the community better. So these are the two things I wanted to add at the end. Thank you so much. And first of all, thanks a lot for attending this uh, session. I think it's great to have financial institutions, especially national financial institutions, participate. And thanks for flagging the issue around risk sharing, also exploring the potential of various financial instruments like guarantee schemes, et cetera and the importance of concessional lending. And I think that's, that's critical to unlock the further uh, you know, impact or leverage further financial financing from private sector eventually. 
So thanks a lot for that. Uh, I know Bimalji has raised his hands. If you can keep it very brief, Bimalji, in the interest of time, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think in uh, COP26, one of the things that we should aim is basically strong recognition of LLD within adaptation, loss and damage, and resilience in the discussions. And on in terms of financing the reinfencing re LLD fund within this developed country fund, adaptation fund, GCF and others, I think that is really important. So we should argue for adaptation plus. And this plus is basically LLD. And I think we, while we argue for more additional funds within adaptation, I think we also need to really look into how LLD will get its shares. So certain caps or certain, you know, reinfence fund that will go directly for LLD, I think will be quite powerful in terms of scaling up locally led adaptation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I see Sarandana has typed her response. It's, it's not just about delivering money, but about convening collaborators. That's equally important from a climate finance point of view. If we can go back to the uh, third question, maybe, um, I don't know who wants to start. Marek, do you want to start? COP26, one, one key point. So I'll just build up. We didn't get fully to that point, so I'll just build on what we already said. So a commitment to reform international accounting standards that work for low Thank you, Aisha. Um, so our COP26 conversation really echoes what Sarantian has put in the chat. So it wasn't about an amount of money. It was really more about um, wanting donors to be more innovative in how they disperse that funding and who they bring into that process of developing the proposals. Um, we, I'll just flag, we talked about indigenous and traditional knowledge as being a really key entry point for LLA. So something innovative where that, you know, where that is integrated, for instance, would be an example of, of what we talked about. Thank you. So innovative and integrated. Paul. So, so we had a conversation that, that brought up kind of you, you know, the, the predictable points around, you know, increasing finance, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the most interesting, most interesting thing to raise um, right at the end, we talked about something outside the formal COP process and using uh, it as a platform for people who are there or engage virtually to start to develop um, uh, synergies of language and asks uh, and approaches so that we come across as more of a movement for, for locally led adaptation rather than a series of groups, which led Sheila to go a little bit rogue and propose a fourth question for our group to discuss, um, which was how many of us would be interested in participating um, in an ongoing series of conversations and actions between COPs so that we don't get to this time next year and have the same conversation in advance of COP27. And it was a resounding yes from our group and I would imagine it would be similar for others. Thanks, Paul. Aditya, anything from your side? Uh, the message loud and clear from our group was that the, uh, there needs to be a big advocacy push at COP for easier access to finance for local entities. And a veteran of many COPs in our group were felt looking at the momentum around LLA this COP can be the LLA COP. So I think that was the headline message um, from our group. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll move on to the uh, last chat shower, which very much resonates with what Paul mentioned. We would like to hear from you um, one follow-up action that you think we would like to see to scale up local adaptation post COP26 in 2022. So please um, type your responses, the don't send yet. One action that you would like to see for scaling up LLA in 2022. Follow up on Sheila's excellent suggestion, collaboration with different actors. Develop LLA coalition. LDC's declaration for supporting LLD. Most vulnerable countries have a LLA funding mechanism that is sustainable, inclusive, and evolving. Very interesting. More dedicated funds for direct financing to LLA. Continue monitoring. Global and national decentralization of decision making on adaptation. More capacity building sessions, including private sector and public banks. That's great. Fantastic. So that was very, very rich. Um, a discussion and it was truly a dialogue. So thank you everybody for attending. I mean, I think we clearly saw a change in, in narrative in this dialogue where we all recognize the importance 
that uh, national systems have to play if you want to scale up locally led adaptation in a systematic and sustainable and inclusive manner, uh, which requires uh, for us uh, to lobby and advocate in the national climate policies plans to strengthen recognition of LLA and its principles, its in, in projects and investments and supporting them and also in financing and in financial targets, et cetera. We heard a lot about financing, the dollar, both the dollar figure we heard recently from colleague in Nepal that it is important to have traditional financing. So we should not um, you know, forget about that. But at the same time, it's also about how, how financing is programmed, how it's planned, how it trickles down, how it flows. Um, is, is it financing for specific projects or financing for programs or financing for outcomes and results based financing? It's critical. We heard from private sector and banking institutions their importance and to explore the importance of various financial products and financial instruments available for scaling up local adaptation. And the third aspect we heard was a lot about longer term financing, longer term programming. And I think we need to be hard to we're here to question ourselves if we really want longer term financing for local lit adaptation then what kind of changes are needed in our institutions which would enable that longer term longer term financing so in terms of strengthening institutions or sending existing national systems whether it's on budget or off treasury systems uh, we need to emphasize that we need to look at uh, larger governance and decentralization uh, processes, as well as looking at more uh, capacity at the local level uh, around organizing communities, working with collaboration with local governments and other partners. So collaboration was a very big thing. So at the end of it, it's all about how do we, uh, from now, if we have to identify concrete actions, how do we um, strengthen national systems, how we look at financing, not just the quantum of financing, but also the quality of how the financing is dispersed. And of course, a longer term engagement and what kind of institutional changes and collaborations are needed to achieve the long term um, solution. So with that, thank you so much, everybody, for joining this dialogue. I would specifically like to thank colleagues from Save the Children Australia, IIED, ICAD, and WRI for, for, for the excellent present preparations for this event. And I'll hand it over to now Aisha Dinshaw from WRI to talk about the opportunities to endorse and engage at the COP on LLA. So Aisha, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Argo, and thank you for your excellent moderation. Um, just very, very quickly, um, Ebony, if you could go to the next slide. Um, to flag, this is um, almost our last dialogue. We have one more for Latin America and the Caribbean tomorrow, if you would like to join. But um, we will have a really comprehensive report out because these have been incredibly rich discussions. And so once the dialogue series is complete, we will um, you know, report out. And as we've been discussing, this will be just one step along this journey. Uh, we also have the videos of the case studies that I put the link to the videos of all the case studies that you heard about in the chat. And if there are other case studies that you're aware of that you can share with us, we would love to hear about them. Um, so please do. Um, next slide. Uh, so of course, COP26 is going to be a major moment, but it's not the only moment. Um, so please continue to engage with us throughout. Um, but at COP26, you know, the adaptation, adaptation campaign is really putting locally led adaptation at the heart of adaptation loss and damage day. Um, so flagging, we have uh, voices from the frontline session um, uh, that's on November 8th from 9 to 10 a.m. And that's really an opportunity for us to bring all of this discussion and these asks that we've been brainstorming about um, to COP. Uh, there's also a resilience hub, and you can see all the events that are happening there that are linked to LLA. And there's a dedicated LLA hub. So um, we really encourage anyone who's interested in having more informal uh, conversations, like almost um, interviews between stakeholders involved in locally led adaptation. It's a very intimate setting, um, but we welcome hybrid um, or uh, physical um, you know, in-person attendance there. And I've put um, the email address that you can reach out to if anyone's interested in having any of those LLA conversations at the LLA Hub, or you can reach out to any of us. And then of course, there's Development and Climate Days, where we have an event on 
financing mechanisms to contribute to lo inclusive locally led adaptation, specifically in fragile and conflict settings, and a second one on private sector and the role of the private sector in supporting business models for locally led adaptation. So there's lots there. Um, if, there's, if there are events that you're aware of that you would like to share with our community of practice, please do tell us. We have a tracker and we can circulate this so that everyone's aware of all the amazing locally led adaptation efforts happening at COP. And then finally, just um, a request or an invitation to join all of those who have endorsed the principle for locally led adaptation. Um, do get in touch with us if you want to understand more what that could look like for your organization. Um, and again, COP26 is a moment for new endorsements, um, but we, we really look forward to engaging with this community, you know, in the lead up to COP, but definitely after COP. COP is one moment of many, and we, um, we really value all of the input that you've provided today. So thank you so much, and thank you again, Otto, for brilliant facilitation and moderation. Take care, everybody.